This is Pete the Kid Chocolate. And I'm a bust a flow for y'all because this is what I do. And everybody is like, what, what, what is he doing? No. I'm rocking with y'all. Yeah, this is Pete the Kid Chocolate. And right now you rocking with Real Friends, Real Talk. And the winner is Real Fans, Real Talk. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special edition of Real Fans, Real Talk. I'm Mark the Statman Skevich, alongside my co-host, Trip Young. And we have a very special guest on this episode, former WBA welterweight champion of the world, five-time Golden Gloves champion, Golden Gloves Hall of Fame member, and Olympic gold medalist, Mark Breland, thanks for coming on the program today. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, Trippy. A lot of accolades you just named. I thought you was gonna stop, but you well, kept going. Well, I, I was—I uh, should have just been, uh, done the, like the uh, boxing announcing voice. Yeah, that was—you know. <laughs> like, but, but you know what? I, what I think is actually because you named a lot of accolades right there. Well, one thing that you didn't say, without, which I think is bigger than all of that stuff, is that. Mr. Breland is also from Brooklyn, where we are both from. So I think that's that's even bigger than all of that stuff because we love to rep our borough. So oh, yeah. that I think is a huge deal. Maybe we should do it over and say Brooklyn's own Mark <laughs> <Yeah>. Breland. <laughs> All right, we'll we're, right. we're going to get into all the uh, accolades in a second, but first let's start with uh, the beginning. What made you fall in love with the sport of boxing and get involved? Well, when I was eight years old, a friend of my parents took me to see Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier wow. in 71, and um, I loved it ever since then. And what was it like uh, growing up in Brooklyn? Uh... Uh, I mean, I, you know, I played football. I was terrible at basketball, terrible. I was tall, skinny, everybody's like, come on, I'm like, nah, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> but um, I just, uh, it was just something that I just enjoyed doing. And you know, growing up, growing up there was it was just a lot of fun. You know, just be, you know, as a kid, going to fresh air fun camps and all that stuff. But um, I really was focused on boxing. You know, I was just everybody seeing me, all like the big guys. I got a you know I got a pass because it was like here 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 come Mark. I always had my bag. Let little man go. Let little man go. So. That, you know, that was good for me. So it was just, I was just, you know, intrigued with boxing. What age did you start training? Uh, around 10 years. I started, I started training at 10 years old. Okay. And your record as an amateur is an impressive 110 wins with only one loss. Um, Five-time Golden Gloves. When did you... Um, make the move into uh, from amateur to professional? Well, well, let me correct the first part of this one. I started, well, I started when I was eight years old. I started boxing when I was eight. Um, and I guess by the time I was 10, I had maybe eight or nine fights. My parents didn't know at the time, though. No. Those those are <laughs> those amateur fights are, aren't on your official record, I oh, guess. No, no, I got a lot of them that weren't. Yeah. <laughs> we won't tell your parents. You know, <laughs> no, we didn't let the tapes out. We'll black that part out. Um, wh which boxing gym did you train at as a child? Um, Bedford Stuyvesant. Bo well, no, well, I, it was um, Broadway Gym on Myrtle Avenue, and then Spartan Gym on Myrtle Avenue on Myrtle Avenue on Broadway. 
then bed side boxing on uh, Marcus Garvey. Is the gym still open? Yeah, Marcus Garvey, yes, still open. It's not as well known as it used to be, but it's still open. Okay. All right, and going into the Olympics, what was that like? I mean, you have it, the Olympics happened to be in America, in Los Angeles, 1984, representing your country. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience? Hmm. It was a lot of fun. It was very draining, though, because I guess from my amateur career coming up, I had a lot of knockouts. And going into the Olympics, you know, how would sell? You know, everybody was looking for knockouts. And my first two fights, I won 5-0 decision, decisions, I mean, clean, and I got booed, and I'm like, wow. They want to see the big knockouts. They want to see the knockouts, and I'm like, wow. So then, my third third fight, I fought a guy from Mexico who was 3-0 and with three knockouts, and I knocked him out in the first round. <clears throat> and the first thing I could hear, Howard Cosell, oh, he is back. I'm like, I never went nowhere, man. <laughs> you know, you got but, a decision for the first yeah. two fights. And so then, you know, when I won the next fight, the next two fights, <clears throat> You know, when you know, talk with the crowd, talk with all the press, and you know, say, "Well, how do you feel?" And I said, "Well, I feel okay. I'm just glad it's over." Did I know the Olympics? Obviously, is, is huge because that's a worldwide thing. But you, I know, as as a child, you it was your dream to fight in Madison Square Garden, and you got to fight in the Golden Gloves Championships in Madison Square Garden. So, did that mean more to you than winning the gold at the Olympics? Yes. Um, you know, because, you know, when I, being at the fight with Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, they cut the lights out. And then you walk down, you walk down the aisle with that one beam of light, and you get in the ring, and it lights up. And when I, you know, when I, when I um, made the finals in my first year, and the same thing happened, I'm like, wow. If I didn't box anymore, that was, that that was, was, that was enough for me right there. Not everyone gets to have their dreams come true. Get, getting, <laughs> getting back to uh, the knockouts during your Golden Club career, 21-0, and 0, 19 of them were knockouts, and 14 were in the first round. So do you feel that, you know, you said the um, saying, well, he's back. Do you feel that that expectation is something that you uh, always had throughout your career that you know, expected to knock somebody out? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, but I am... Um but I realized after a while, you know, you can hit somebody and they look at you like, okay, <laughs> that's all you got. So I had to learn how to box more. Yeah, like uh, Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until yeah, they get punched. Got, everybody has a plan until they get hit. You're right about that. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Now, because I want to get into the pros. Now, it <clears throat> took you three years to win your first, your first title. Right. What is the, the preparation like going going into each fight for you? Um, just training, training, training. A lot of running. Um, well, what I did was, I, you know, I would, you know, we look at the fighter and you know, look at his fights and try to scope out, see what he has, and see what faulty, you know, what what he what I can get away with and what I can't, and um, just hard training. I stayed in shape, and you know, I, I figured my my attitude. I want I want to go the distance, but I want to be in shape enough. To, I want to be in shape enough to go the distance, but if I don't have to, I'm good, it's yeah. even better. Everybody wants to knock out <laughs> the first round, get it over with, add some more years onto your career. Oh yeah, if you can, if you can do it, but sometimes you do have to go the distance in, oh, yeah. in the fight. How important is uh well? What is your diet like during training? Well, I never had a I never had a problem making weight. <clears throat> 147. I was 147, I think, in the Junior Olympics. Mm -hmm. And then when I went my first fight in the Golden, my first year in the Golden Gloves, I trained so hard. I went down to 139. <clears throat> so my first year in the Golden Gloves, I won at 139. But the rest was 147. But I, I used to go to the weigh-in eating. I just never. So no no strict diet or anything. Just eat whatever you yeah, want. Just eat whatever I want uh -huh. to eat. But I ate. But I ate good. But I mm -hmm. Just I figured if you eat good, your body, you know, would perform better. Do you when you when you're training? Because I know some fighters say they stay away from their female counterparts mm -hmm. when they're in training, and some say they they hang around them. What, what was your method with that? Were you able to 
be with your significant other during training or is that, is that too much of a distraction for you? No, it wasn't a distraction. I just, um, the weird thing, I trained at this place called Safety Harbor Spa in Florida. Mainly women, just mainly women in the place. And, you know, when I first, the first time I went there, I was like, wow, this is nice. You know, you get massages and the whole thing. And so sparring partners would come like, yo, man, this is nice, Mark. Wow. You know, you got women all over the place. I'm like, okay. So I, after about four or five times going there, you know, my trainer was like, I said, well, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave a week before camp. And he's trying to figure out, wow, why you want to go that early? I just want to go there. I just want to go early. It's okay. Then he realized, he said, okay, you got that whole week. <laughs> Get that week off, and then you can do the rest four weeks. I'm like, okay, good. But um, psychologically and physically, it, it can get you a lot of fighters. How, um, how s soon after a fight do you go back into training for, the, for your next fight? Uh, depending on the fight. But um, normally about a week. A week of week to five days. I like to stay in shape. Okay. I'm scared, I'm, scared of, I'm scared to lose or I'm scared I'm gonna lose if I don't stay in shape. Not too many losses in your career. Uh, one of them was the uh, famous Battle of the Burrows against uh, Bronx's uh, Aaron Superman Davis. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, that was a fight that could have been stopped a couple of times because yeah. of his eye. Do you feel that uh, you thought that this fight was going to be stopped? Was that like a distraction for you, or can you take us back to that? No, I mean, it was a hell of a fight. I mean, we, you know, we were going at it. Um, but they were going to stop the fight that next round, and he just caught me. He just caught me in a good shot. It definitely uh, would have been nice to have that at Madison Square Garden as well. We yeah. spoke with Aaron Davis, and he said uh, Reno, Nevada got the, mm -hmm. uh, got the bid on that one. Um, we're, we're actually going to take a quick break and uh, show you guys some of the footage from that epic battle of uh, the Burroughs. And what would Mark Breland when we get back? Five inches taller than Aaron Davis, Breland four years the senior. He's, he's, he's the district attorney here in Reno and he's running. Uh, there is Mark Breland, born in Brooklyn. He now lives in Manhattan. And of course, that's half of the New York rivalry you see here today because Aaron Davis was born in the Bronx, New York, and he still resides where he grew up in that same area, and there is Alex. I don't live in New York. This is a good fight no matter where you live. It's went again here, and we are only in the beginning of the second round. Mark Breland with a, a dazed look on his face. Oh, and there's the best flurry of the fight by Mark Breland. Aaron Davis looks a little bit tired right now. And Joe Ferriello looks concerned beyond belief. Well, he should be. Dan, I want to be honest about one thing quickly. When I said if Aaron Davis comes out to fight, we could have a very short fight indeed. I never thought it no, would be no. Aaron Davis being the winner. I, I knew what you meant. <laughs> You're an honest man, though, Alex. All right, we are back on Real Fans Real Talk alongside my co-host Trip Young and very special guest Mark Breland. We picked one of the rare fights that you lost, but it was a it was a, a really good fight. Uh, is there any boxers out there that you wish you would have fought during your career? Hmm. Um. I would I, I would have liked to fight Wilfredo Benitez. He was one of my favorite fighters. I mean, he's a guy who's very slick, hard to hit, and um, just a champion. Yeah, definitely. Um, what made you decide that it was time to hang up the gloves? Uh, it wasn't fun anymore. The amateurs was fun. You know, when I turned pro, you know, it was exciting. Like, wow, okay, you know, you can meet these guys, meet this guy, and win a championship. But it's not what everybody think it is. So then you got, you know, the promoters and all of these guys. Everybody's like, you know, putting their hands here, hands here. And so it's not, you know, the fun is gone. 
Do did you ever feel like during your career, uh, any fighters were ducking you? Mm, no, not that. No, not that I know of. No, or could remember. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And one, because I want to go back to this fight really quick. Is it is it hard coming back from a from a loss? No, no. I mean, I just train and. Uh, no, you know, just psychologically, just as long as you're in shape there, you're good to go. Okay. I wanted to throw, ask a question about the uh, fight. Yeah, well, no, more so was just <coughs> after after that loss, just to come in, the bouncing back from a from a loss, um, and and then after that, you went on, you did you did win the win the belt twice. Mm -hmm. Um. The second, the second time you had the belt, it was a, it was a vacant title at the time, right. and and you fought, you fought that fight, and and you won. Um, now, no Stedman, you went into into the uh, the retirement and and whatnot. Um, transitioning your career after after boxing, um, you got into my realm. What I like doing movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna go back to 1983 because that was a good year for me because that was the year I was born. So I'm gonna go back to 1983, and uh, you co-starred with Bill Paxton and David Keith in the Lords of Discipline. Right. How did you one get into doing a feature-length film, mm -hmm. and two, what was it like being in front of the cameras for for a movie? Well, one, uh, this woman named Ellen Chenoweth worked for one of the big um, productions and gave me a call and um, you know, she said, you know, um, I've seen your box and this and that and, you know, we have a part in the movie we would like you to do. I'd like you to come, um, you know, uh, read for it. I'm like, okay. She said, did you have you ever act? I'm like, no. <laughs> but I can act. <laughs> and she's like, okay, so well, you know, we'll have you come out and do it. And I read for it, and she was like, good. So they called me back, and I read for it again, and I got it. And then, now you didn't, you didn't just stop there with that, with that, with that one role. You, just, you, you kept it going. You, you, you got on Miami Vice, which was one of the biggest <laughs> TV shows at the time. You played Bobby Sykes. Bobby Sykes, right. What was that like, being on the mic? Because I know there was a lot of fast calls and women on that set. <laughs> what was that like? I mean, it was good. It was nice, you know, meeting the guys and um, being, in, I guess, being in Miami. Um, it was good because, it, I mean, because TV is different from doing the, um, movie films, but um, it was a difference, you know, the set was different. And, you know, doing the boxing part, it's, it's easy, but it's not as easy as it seems because it's like you got to cut part, you know, don't, you don't want to hit the guy. Yeah. So it's like, okay. But um, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun on the set. I mean, it's not as, um, I guess a lot of people might think it's, you know, it's rough and hard or whatever, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And then, now you, you, did, you, you still stayed on the, on, on the screen. Yeah, a couple of small roles, but you were in another movie, which was one of my favorites, because my main man, Jesus Shuttlesworth, was in that movie, <laughs> and that was He Got Game. He got game. So you teamed up, you were working with Spike Lee on that one, you got to work with Denzel and uh, Ray Allen, of, right. of course. Tell us about it. Well, that was a lot of fun. You know, Spike had, you know, wanted me to do it, and he said, look, I want you to do something different. I don't, you know, I just want you to, you know, he said, all right, take this gun. And they put a wig on me or whatever, and it's like, I want you to act, you know, I want, you, I want to see the rough part of you. And I'm like, all right. So the first role we did, we, we were shooting dice. And I'm like, okay, come on, man. Come on. All right, now. And they're like, nah, come on, Mark. You hang around a lot of these guys. Come <laughs> on. You got to act, man. Act. So I'm like, okay. And so when I did it, I'm like, okay, now, nah, come on. And I'm screaming and yelling. And he's like, okay, that's good, that's good. But it, it, was, um, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Now, it's a Spike, who's also also from from Brooklyn. Right. Um, were you guys friends before the movie? Did you know him growing up in Brooklyn, or did you like meet him during your boxing career? Like, how'd that come about? I knew him, you know, just from Brooklyn, just being around Brooklyn. You know, I know him from being around. Okay. And plus, I made a video with the Pointer Sisters. Dare okay. me, the record. Dare me. That's the first thing I've done. 
and then Spike brought you back for Summer of Sam. Summer of Sam, yeah. <laughs> so, you, you know, you did the guy in Best Eye doing, <laughs> doing the interview. You and Spike, you got a lot of projects together. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you did a, a short Morning Breath right. after that. Um, you did the, the Undercover Man, right. where you played an agent. And then you did a couple of episodes of Lights Out with another friend of the show, Hope McCallany, well, right. uh, starred in that movie, and you, and you did a couple of episodes of that. So your, your, your acting role is, is, is kind of kind of long. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I like, I like acting. It's, you know, it's, um, it's, like, it's like boxing. It's just you don't get hit. Yeah. Well, it's better than boxing <laughs> than, than that. It's, it's, yeah, it's better than boxing. You just don't get hit. Um, but but I, I look at, like, theater. I've done some theater. And theater is more like boxing because you got the crowd. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like you can get distracted at any time, so you have to stay focused. Are you going to be doing any more acting in the, in the future? Or is, or is this going to, was that going to be it lights out? Is that the last thing? No, I hope to. I'm, you know, it's, it's a rough business. It's a rough business to get into, but I, um, I'm still trying just to get in some, you know, different, different parts here, different parts there. Out of the list of everything uh, Trip Young just mentioned, what was your favorite role? Loads of discipline, yeah. Because it was the first? <laughs> well, no. I, um, it was a long roll, and it really um, made me, uh, I just, it made me to really appreciate acting more. And that was the, that was a starring role, too. You were one of the, the main characters. Yeah, one of the main characters. Funny, the weird thing, you know, the guys, they were you know, like torturing me and stuff. And when Bill Paxton, you know, he was doing some stuff and he started he started crying like, "Yo, man, we sorry, we sorry." I'm like, "Yo, man, we getting paid, man." The check is involved, so we got to go. We getting paid. You're not doing this for real, man. Yeah. No. But it was a lot of fun. All right, getting back to boxing, we're gonna <clears> take uh, one of our fan mail questions. Uh, Harold from Brooklyn writes in. Is there any fighter that has a legitimate chance of beating Floyd Mayweather? What do you think? No. I don't think so. I mean, there's... There's nobody now. There's nobody out there. I mean, well, Floyd is, what, 147 now, 156? I don't know what weight they go up and down. Yeah, he's, he's been going, he goes back and forth right. between, between the, the two. So, I don't see nobody doing it right now. Could you have beaten him during your day? You know what? You're from Brooklyn, so I'm gonna say yes automatically. Oh, no, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I um, I'm more of a sharpshooter, as far as like a Tommy Hearns type of style, and it would have been tougher for him because now he's now he's got to come to me. I'm not gonna chase you. Who who from your generation would you say compares most to Floyd Mayweather, as far as uh, fight styles? Styles. Fight styles. I would say Pernell Whitaker, but Pernell was much, you couldn't hit him. It was hard to hit. Floyd is not, he's not easy to hit, but you can hit him. Um, compare him to nobody. Do you think he would dominate in that generation like he dominates this generation of fighters? No, no. Too many, too many punchers. Like you know, Aaron Pryor, guys like Pryor, Tommy Hearns, you know, um, Ray Leonard. You know, the old time fighters, you know, you got a guy doing this here. You keep banging him on the arm, banging him. They keep going after the man's head. Leave the man's head alone. Yeah. You yeah. kill this. It's going to go. So then you think there is a recipe to beat Floyd Mayweather? Oh, yeah. N nobody just no. has been able to figure it out. And Not at all. And, you know, you know, fighters picked who they want to fight today. You know, back when we were fighting, we had to fight who the promoters picked to us. A little bit easier. More of a prima donnas nowadays. Oh, a whole lot of them. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Harold for writing in. If you want to write in your fan mail questions, it's fanmail at realfansrealtalk.com. 
We're here for our special episode with Mark Breland, but we normally air live every Tuesday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on BronxNet Television. If you're watching this on YouTube, you could still see the live broadcast on our website, realfansrealtalk.com. Just go to RFRT Media, drop-down menu, RFRT TV, and you can check out the live stream as well as some of our archived episodes. You can also get reminders by liking us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash realfansrealtalk. Follow us on Twitter at Real Fan Talk. And for our individual contact information, email addresses, Twitter addresses, just go to realfansrealtalk.com under the contact section of the page. Our radio show airs every Sunday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Blog Talk Radio Network and also archived on the iTunes Store. Going to take another fan mail question. Uh, Gary from Trenton writes... Now that Miguel Cotto won the welterweight belt from Sergio Martinez, do you think we will see him fight Canelo Alvarez? Hmm, that's a, that's a tough fight. But then again, if he fights anyway, any, any, if he fights like he fought last week, because that's the best I've ever seen him seem like. But if he fought, he fought that way, it would be a, it would be a good fight. Canelo can punch, but he's kind of slow. All right. And um, we're about at the halfway point of the program, and we do this uh, segment on the show called Shot for Shot. We have two contestants, one judge. The loser has to wear team apparel of a team that they hate the following week, but since this is a special episode, <laughs> the loser will have to wear this Boston Red Sox hat. Um for the remainder of the program. Would you mind uh, doing the honors and uh, judging this okay, edition no of problem. Shot for Shot? And I put a little 20 in there to <laughs> grease the judge up a little bit. Here we go. No, real quick, I wanna, before, before we start, I wanna go, just going back to the Battle of the Burrows. If I'm not mistaken, that was Mills Lane that was ref in that fight. Yes. All right, shout out to Judge Mills Lane. Let's get it on. <laughs> Here we go. If we both agree, no point is awarded, so uh, we'll get us started with the first question. The challenger goes first, which would be Trip Young. I'm the, the more current defending champion on the <laughs> show, so. <laughs> uh, uh, you want to read them out? Okay. Over and under 80%. 80% chance Floyd, Wayne, Floyd Mayweather Jr. breaks Rocky Marciano's record. Um... I mean, I gotta say over because I don't think there's anybody that's gonna beat Floyd Mayweather. So, as long as he continues to fight, I think he'll he'll break the record. So I'm gonna say over. Yeah, it's kind of hard to disagree. I think it pretty much is a hundred percent. We can't think of a single boxer that could could beat him, and uh, I'm sure he's unless he wants to retire before breaking it, which I doubt he'll do. Um, I I think he's gonna break it. So I guess uh, question number two. Here we go. If Marquez and Pacquiao fight a fifth time, what is more likely to happen? Marquez wins by decision or Pacquiao wins by knockout? I'd probably say Marquez winning by decision. I don't think Pacquiao is capable of knocking him out. Um, so I'm going to go with the decision. Yeah, I got I to gotta agree. If he was going to knock him out, he would have knocked him out before. If anything, Marquez will probably will knock Pacquiao out again. So we got a lot of agreement going on right now for the first two questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, which current heavyweight has the best chance of beating Valdemir Klitschko? Uh, <laughs> I mean, right now, to be honest, I don't think that there is a heavyweight that can beat Vladimir Klitschko. I just think that he's too good and he has a stronghold on the heavyweight division. But if we have to, to pick a name... I'm going to go with uh, someone that, that you, Mr. Breland, are very familiar You're with. You're stealing my answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to have to say Deontay Wilder because, I mean, I've, I've watched his last six fights. Um, that's when I really started to notice who he was. And actually, the reason I even watched him was because I saw you mm -hmm. in his corner and I was like oh that's that's Mark and then I saw that you were training him mm -hmm. and then I started following him after that but I mean you can't deny 31 and 0 31 knockouts and he hasn't been past the fourth round um 
I don't know if, if right now he has the experience to get into the ring with Vladimir Klitschko, who hasn't lost in, I believe, 10 years now. He hasn't lost and is not looking like he's slowing down anytime soon. But if I had to pick one heavyweight fighter, I would, I would say Deontay Wilder. Well, or his brother, but who just retired, you know, Vitaly Klitschko, but he's retired now, so. I guess we're in agreement here again. I was going to try to g grease up the judge a little bit by picking one of his fighters too, but apparently Trippioni was cheating on my notes. <laughs> but, yeah, you should have given him 100 like I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to jump into number four. Well, MMA be bigger, be, well, MMA be bigger than boxing. This is a tough one. Um, I think that like a lot of boxing fans are kind of getting sick of some of the bad decisions out there. Um, but I, I don't think so. I think it's just too uh, too much history in boxing. Too many people in love with the sport of boxing, regardless of uh, the bad decisions that are out there. I, I, I think boxing will still stay popular than MMA. Yeah, I gotta agree. Again, I mean, when you have, I mean, especially now, I mean, it's not even gonna come close because a, a May, one Mayweather card is gonna make more money than probably every MMA fight that happens in the year combined. Well, I mean, eventually Mayweather's gonna retire. Retires, but, but I mean, but you still, the names in the sport of boxing are still bigger than the names in MMA. You know, I get the average, you know, the average fan of of, of fighting sports. Is gonna name be able to name from from MMA maybe John John Bones Jones, uh, Rashad Evans maybe Rampage Jackson because he played Mr. T in the movie. Whereas with boxing, I mean even the, the casual boxing fan, I mean you know Mayweather, you know who Pacquiao is, you know who Marquez is. I mean you know Broner just because he's he's so out there. You know they it's just the the, the the talking ability of the boxing fighters there's a, a lot of like cockiness and these guys are all over so I would still have to, to say boxing is going to be bigger than MMA for, for a long time to come so we got to go to number 5 hopefully we can get some disagreement on number 5 here <laughs> now would Adrian Bronner be able to beat Pacquiao or Alvarez I, I, you know I like Adrian Bronner <laughs> You know, I love the fact that he brushes his hair in the ring after after every fight. Or he has someone brush his hair in the ring, but I I don't think that he could beat Pacquiao even 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 right now. Um, you know, even after the Marquez knockout, I don't think that he could beat Manny Pacquiao. I, I don't think he has the ring experience yet to beat Manny Pacquiao. Uh, with Canelo Alvarez. It's, poss it's possible, but I, I still would take Canelo over Adrian Broner. I mean, you know, he Broner's that that loss that he took two fights ago was just a really bad loss. And I mean, I know Canelo lost to Mayweather, and it was a bad loss as well. But that's Floyd Mayweather, who's the, the greatest right now. So I, I gotta say, no, I don't think he can beat either one of them. No, on both counts, and uh, I'm in agreement. I mean, that loss, uh, it, was a, it was a pretty bad loss, and it, you know, kind of uh, took my confidence in uh, Broner out the window pretty much. So, yeah, had, uh, he not, had he not lost that fight like that, I would have said he could probably beat Canelo. I still wouldn't think that he could beat Manny, Manny Pacquiao, but I think he would, he would have had a chance against Canelo, but that loss really did it just made me not... You know, believing in in Bruno like that anymore. I got to see what he does. You know, his next couple of fights, depending on who he fights, because I, I don't. I, I still, you know, I want to see him fight some some bigger names now, and then um, so we can kind of debate. But we are at a tie. Um, Mark, do do you do you have an overtime question that you can throw out there for us? Hmm. I know we're putting you on the spot, but you are an actor, so you know, and you're good in the ring. So I think <laughs> if anybody can do it, it's you. Well, um, <clears throat> let me see. Well, on, on fighters or the fighters? You know, yeah, yeah, anything, anything, anything in sports. In sports. Yeah. Anything in sports. Okay, who's going to be the next big basketball player? Who's coming out of college right coming now? out of college. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Wiggins, even though um, the hype 
you know, kind of died down with him a little bit. Um, I, I just think he's, you know, the, the big man who I'm drawing a blank with, his teammate. I think his drone beat. He, he's got a lot of. Uh, he's a big man with get, getting injuries early, and when big men get injuries, we see it all the time. And it's just not a good mix. So I, I don't think that he'll stay healthy in the NBA. So I'm going to go with Wiggins. All right, we finally got some disagreement. Um, I'm going with the Blue Devils, Jabari Parker. I think that he has the most complete game, um, and I think that he has the most NBA-ready game right now. I think he'll be able to make that transition into the NBA a lot easier than Wiggins, and I think that he's going he's gonna to ultimately be a better a player. Not to say that Andrew Wiggins is not going to be good. I think he's still going to be good, but I think that Jabari Parker, because he has a, a game that's NBA ready right now. We'll have an easier time in the in the league, so I'm gonna go with Jabari Parker. That's just because you're a Duke fan. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Now, okay, who's gonna win the World Cup? Oh wait, we do we, 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 we didn't we disagreed. Yeah, we got good yeah, on, on the question. Who who you gonna take on that one? I'm oh, going oh, with Wiggins. He's going yeah. with Parker. Who do you agree with? Well, Wiggins, Wiggins is not a bad. He's, he's a good player. I think I might have to go with Wiggins on this one. All right, you're right, going to have to take that Brooklyn Nets hat off for the rest of the show. <laughs> As a fellow Yankee fan, I don't want to see you do it, but... You I mean, need a messed up snapback hat, too. <laughs> All right, I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm I'm in the same winner and still champion of shot for shot, Mark the Statman Stevens. Brazil, the, the, the tie that they had against Mexico kind of made me, uh, you know, do a little uh, discount double check with, with them, and I'm thinking. Uh, Germany looked very convincing so, so far. Um, so, uh, awkwardly enough, I'm going with Germany. I'm not German, by the way, or anything. So, um, but I, I just think that they look the most convincing and well put together team out there. So, I'm, you know, what? I'm gonna still go with Brazil. I'm, I mean, I know they, they did struggle, but um, I'm gonna go with Brazil. I think they'll they'll bounce back. You know, because different. Different teams cause different challenges to you know to, to their opponent. So I just think that it was one of those situations where you know it's the same thing with, with boxing. You might have have problem with one fighter, you know what I mean, and then somebody else fights that guy and just totally different. You, you know, tears him apart with no problem. So I mean, I'm gonna still stick with Brazil. I think that they'll they'll be able to bounce back and and, and take from that that struggle and, and still get that win. You know, I like Brazil on that one. Well, the good thing Shot for Shot is over already. Uh, <laughs> I knew I should have the question it was, a, it was a sudden death, uh, you know, just like in overtime in uh, soccer and hockey. Uh, it, you know, it, it, well, it, it, hockey. it happens, though. It, it definitely happens. Um, but now, now that we, we got our little, little World Cup in, I do want to go back because Don Shot for Shot did mention, um, again, the fighter that you are training right now currently, Deontay Wilder. Who uh, I said is 31 and 0, 31 knockouts, and I, I think that he is the future of the the heavyweight division. Um, how did you, did it come about that you wound up training Deontay? Well, my my ex manager Shelly Finkel, they he has something to do with uh, Deontay too. So um, the, uh, J J D is his man, his, uh, his other manager. Uh, they, they gave me a call and asked me would I train Deontay, and I'm like, all right, no problem, and um. When I went down to uh, Alabama, I was staying on there for like maybe four or five months at a time, just training him. And um, he's been coming along. It's just you know, it's just you know, he had a very short amateur career. Yeah. So I have to start him back from basics, and and that's what he's still doing now. Just you know, he's got much better, but still, he he got he got power working for him. He was he was a, a national Golden Gloves champ though. Yeah. So he de he does have that going for him. Um, how far would you say he is from becoming a heavyweight champion? No. Or how close is he? Very. Very close. Do you, you know? I, and I, I said earlier I didn't think that he was ready to step in the ring with Klitschko, but do you think that? Or I'll say, what point do you think he will be ready to face a Vladimir Klitschko? I think he'll be ready soon, very soon. Um, 
he's got, you know, he's supposed he, he he's supposed to be fighting Stefan for the title. He's because he's next in he's he's next in line. So, you know, if not, you know, whoever we fight again, well, well, I say 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 like this: here, once he fights Klitschko, I think he'll be ready for that fight. Um, you have to take away his jab. Let's go his jab. Take away his jab. Yeah. And that's the main thing. That's but not, job. But now his jab is just as long. The long if it's not, his jab is just as long, if not longer. But I don't know. You know, I know he can't take a good shot. That Klitschko can't take yes. a good shot. Oh, they can. He can't take. No, he can't. Oh, he can't take a good shot. No. And, and Deontay hits right. very hard. He's a, he's a very powerful puncher. Right. I mentioned hasn't made it out of the fourth round. Um, now. He's six foot seven, six, seven. and you. I know in, in the previous interviews we were talking about being a taller fighter, and you said that um, he doesn't need to be bobbing and weaving in no. the, in the ring. Why is that? Too tall. I mean, if you if you got somebody shorter than you, well, I did it. I did it, but still, <laughs> if you got somebody shorter than you, you don't want to bob and weave in your six foot seven. Now, if you got somebody who's six foot seven. Yeah. That's a little different, but um, Valdemar he stands up. He stands up straight, so you don't want to bother him. With, so you just stand up straight with him and go jab for jab. So you 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 think that Deontay would be able to beat Vladimir oh, Klitschko? Yeah. Oh yeah. All right, definitely looking forward to that fight. We're going to take another break, and uh, we're going to show you guys some footage of the future heavyweight champion of the world, <laughs> uh, Deontay Wilder. I'm going to be right back with more with Mark Breland. And this is from his, uh, his fight. You're kind of with building to that. You're, getting, you're getting Scott. Scott looking. I will look at it in slow motion. You'll get a chance to see some of the things Paulie was talking about. The jabs. And again, see, come around the side. The right hand looked like it didn't land clean. But, man, this goes to show you the power of this guy. He's got all knockout wins. But, again, the left hand comes around the side. Scott, whatever part of the right hand did hit him, he didn't see it because no. he was looking all left hand the whole time. A lead left hook followed by the lethal right hand, a crushing combination. And yet another look, the, the feeling out hook. Now, I, seriously, part of that punch landed, but it bounced off the glove. And some of the fans are actually booing when they look at the replay, but the power of Wilder. I mean, Scott didn't come here to, to fall down. So He's clearly, only been down once you know, square prior. And I think the temple shot to the left head may have had an impact and may have been an equilibrium shot. But we are back on Real Fans Real again. Talk with my co-host Trip Young and special guest Mark Breland. Uh, what is it like as far as you've trained other fighters in the past, the, your connection with them? Do you feel like as a mentor that you uh, end up becoming really close with these fighters? Yeah, some of them, not all of them, some of them. But, he, you know, Deontay... Um, you know he's very focused. You know when, when he when he's boxing, it's just a thing of where trying to keep him calm down, trying to keep him. You know sometimes he gets very excited, and you don't want to get overly excited. You know you can get hit like that. There was um, a video uh, a couple a couple weeks ago on YouTube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, which I guess the kid was saying some really crazy things, and he we came down to the gym, and he was gonna. They had I guess they had a little. Sparring session, if we want to call it that. How how did that even wind up happening? Well, what happened? They they had um, you know, they signed papers. You know, you know, like this. You know, if you you know if you get hurt, on here you go. If you get, you know, so. But my thing is, you know, I spoke to Deontay. He said, "Look, I had on two right hand gloves." But I'm like, "Why are you hitting this guy?" But the guy was talking about his daughter. Yeah. And stuff like that. So. He said he, he, you know, they made him sign a, you know, form. Waiver. Made him sign a waiver, so it's like, you know, he, he said when we started talking about my daughter, I just started going off on her. But he's, you know, I, I said, but you didn't. <laughs> I told him, I said, but you didn't hit him right because you didn't stay down. He said I had on two left hand gloves. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, no one. I said, but you can't be doing that, man. <laughs> I mean, because you know, you might hit, you might hit him and hurt your hand and yeah. hurt your hand. I mean, that's. Bad thing. I'm sure it's all good though when when you hit him. Oh, I could imagine. I could imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Now, you are also training right now, uh, Jorge Turan. No, I used to train him a while back. Okay, he's not. He's not. He's no. not fighting anymore. Uh, I think he is, but he's in Vegas now. 
Okay. I was, um, you know, I spoke to him the other day. His mom is not doing too good, but um, he uh, he's still doing. He's doing good though. Okay. So is right now, so right now you're just training Deontay. Yes. And 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 that's it. He's but right now he's not he's not training. No, I mean he's he's you know doing stuff with the strength trainers and stuff like that, but he stays he stays in shape. At what point do do you, um, I guess, go down to Alabama and, and start with, with your... Well, you know, you know, I guess if you fight for the title, it'll probably be about four weeks. I'll do about four weeks. Normally, I'll do about three weeks, but it'll be about, probably when a title fight, about four or five weeks. Okay. So the next, then you're not going to train him for the next fight? Yeah. Oh, you're actually, okay, you're yeah. training him for the, okay. Now, I know, because since you're up here in Brooklyn, New York, and since you are training, um, we've been trying to get Mark Statman Skevich here into the heavyweight division. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we tried the MMA, we tried some other boxing, but now we want to come to you. Do you think that you can get Statman here to the championship at the heavyweight division? I mean, I can get him a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't him. seen what I, I can do. But now... Well, <laughs> can we, all right. can we, can I'm we set gonna up the training session? There you go. Okay, you can all right, see all right, what he right. has. We can do that. We can set up a training session. All right. Sounds and, like a good plan. Um, Y'all can both spar. Well, I'm not trying to train. I'm, you know, no, I'm, but you can just spar and just see what he has. Well, I'm, I've seen him box before, so I don't want to get in the, you know, because he doesn't want to get What it is is that, you know, because I'm, right now, I'm married to Serena, and, you know, fans, they know that Serena Williams at home, mm -hmm. um, and she doesn't want me to, to partake in those kind of events anymore, so that's why I'm kind of retired from that. But I'm trying to be encouraging and support Statman in his dream of being a heavyweight fighter. Oh, okay, okay. So that's what, yeah, that's what, that, what that's about. Well, we can work on that. Uh, we'll start with the Golden Gloves <laughs> <laughs> and, and see how it goes, I guess. Um, bringing up uh, one of the people that you trained in the past, uh, how close were you with uh, Vernon Forrest? Oh, you know, me and Vernon was real tight, nice guy, um, great fighter. Uh, you know, it's sad just that had to happen, things happen, ha had to happen like like it happened. Yeah, for those of you that uh, don't know, in 2009, he was tragically murdered at a gas station in Georgia. Um, what, I mean, what was it like coping with that? You know, it was kind of hard. You know, it's just a thing of where, you know, he has a guy who who's a good guy. You know, I mean, like you say, he was getting gas, and the guy tried to, you know, take his rings and all that stuff. So, I guess you can, you know, I mean, you never know what you're going to do at that, you know, at a moment like that. So it's like, he can be hot, you know, you're hot headed, you know, it's like. Um, Especially when you have the confidence of right. you know, being a champion fighter and everything, so. And then I guess they knew who he was, so it's more, it's a rough situation, a rough situation. It's not, it wasn't good at all. Right, um. You mentioned that you're close to some of these fighters and you're also uh, familiar with the uh, Ring 10 organization. Mm -hmm. What do you tell your fighters as far as uh, managing their money properly? Or you don't get involved no, with no, that at all? that's their money. They got to handle that. All right. No, I mean... If Just don't spend it all in one place. Well, ho hopefully they, they take <laughs> your advice with that. Um, what would you say is your greatest accomplishment as a fighter? Retiring? No, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> My greatest accomplishment. Um, or is, is your greatest accomplishment is it yet to come? Well, as a fighter, I would say the Olympics. Okay. Because that's something I've always wanted to win, and I mean, and my thing is, everything I set out to do, I did. I'm like, wow. So. Um, and I, I want to I want to go back to uh, Deontay for one second because he is um, signed to Golden Boy, right. and uh, Richard Schaefer, who recently left Golden Boy, has that had uh, any effect on him and his situation with Golden Boy? Because I know, like Floyd Mayweather, recently said that he's not going to be dealing with Golden Boy anymore s since Richard Schaefer left. So has that had any effect on Deontay and what he's doing? No, I don't know. I don't. I don't do the managing stuff. That's between his manager and stuff like that. But uh, 
Mm, I don't know. You got a point. I mean, got a point there. I don't. I gotta find out. Okay. Um. Also, you do a lot of philanthropy work. Um. You are affiliated. When, like my statement said, with Ring 10, New York, uh, March of Dimes, uh, Boys Town, and uh, a couple others. But you are actually, right now, you're, you're working on the Mark Breland Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell the people at home a little bit more about your foundation? Well, what we do, we, talk, we um, work with kids, go to school, go to, go to different schools and talk to kids about staying healthy, exercising, um, you know, just... Uh, Staying healthy, you know, exercising, you know, listen to your teachers, listen to your parents. Um, and then we do stuff with fighters, retired boxers who, um, who are suffering from different things. We try to help them out and, you know, get them back on their, get them back on their feet or just get them back to a certain point where they can function better. Yeah. Um, one other question about the Olympics. Do you think uh, the U.S. will uh, win a gold uh, the next time around in boxing? You know, I think they got, they, what I found out, they have a, the Cuban, one of the Cuban coaches, a coach in the USA team. So how, how are you going to beat Cuba? How how does the Olympics go about selecting the trainers for the Olympics? Uh, the Olympic Committee, President, um, I guess the whole board get together, I guess, and figure it out. But I don't, I, I don't see that as a great um, move right there. Have you have you thought about uh, training the the U.S. fighters? I got called down there once and I wanted to become an Olympic trainer. They said I didn't have enough experience. Well, after you uh, train the stat man to become a <laughs> yeah. champion, then they, they have no choice but to take me. <laughs> have no other choice. So that, that's definitely we're gonna have to we're gonna have to definitely work on that. Um, so right now you're still you still have a, a gym in in Brooklyn that you're training out of when you're not uh, working with uh, with Deontay. Oh yeah, I work. Out. I still work out myself. Um, how can uh, any potential boxing um, boxers or fighters or just you know people that want to come and get in shape? How can they um, get information on the gym and, and what's the best time to come to talk to you or whoever whoever runs the gym on a day to day basis? Oh no, I just do different. Um, um, like like in the boxing gym, I just go to gyms every now and then. I don't I don't I just go work out pretty much. I mean I work out myself, okay. stay in shape. I don't I'm getting to boxing too much, but. A lot of different fighters. Who would you say is the greatest fighter of all time to come out of Brooklyn? Besides yourself. Greatest fighter of all time to come out of Brooklyn. Mike Tyson. That's almost a no-brainer, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, all right, it's about that time for the uh, final thought uh, segment of the program. Uh, Trip Young, uh, final uh, thought question that you uh, have in mind? Um, you know what? Well, I'm just going to make my final thought. Um, could you, well, could, if, if people do want to get involved and help out which, with the Mark Breland Foundation, could you just tell the people at home how they can um, go about doing that? Well, I email, I'll give you an email address. And do you have a, a, a website or anything like that, or Facebook or Instagram, um, Twitter? Outside the ropes. Dot org. Okay. So that's where you guys got to go if you are trying to, if you want to be a part of the Mark Breland Foundation, if you want to help out. Outside the ropes. Dot org, and you can get all of the information from the website. Also, uh, the other organization, Ring Ten and Y. Dot com for those of you that want to help out with that foundation. Uh, I'm just going to ask one last question before we wrap things up. Name your, your top three greatest boxers of all time, any weight division. Muhammad Ali, 
Sugar Ray Robinson. I'm Mark Breland. No, nah, Alfredo Benitez was a great boxer. Do you think that uh, if, if uh, Floyd Mayweather does break Mar Rocky Marciano's record, does he go up in that top three or no? No. All right, well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, wait, Mark, wait, wait, before you, before you close out, where do you, do you have him ranked right now? And if he does break Marciano's record, where would you have him ranked? Floyd? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, my mind was flying all over the place. You said if he wins, if he breaks if his he record. If he breaks Rocky Marciano's record, yeah. Is he in the top three? Yeah, we'll have to, yeah you would have to put him in the top three. Yeah. And as we say, he retires before he, before he breaks the record. Where would you put him? Is he still in the top five, top ten? Top five still. Okay. All right. And uh, Mark Breland, uh, your final thought, anything you want to say out there to the fans? Keep watching boxing. No, let me stop. <laughs> um, just stay healthy. All right, boxing's definitely a, a way to stay healthy, and make sure you check out those websites and our website as well, realfansrealtalk.com. Mark Breland, the five-time Golden Gloves champion, recent member of the Golden Gloves Hall of Fame, former WBA welterweight champion, and of course, the 1984 gold medalist champion. Thank you once again for coming on the program. For Trip Young and Mark Breland, I'm Mark the Statman Skevich. Thank you all for joining us, and have a good night, everyone. RealFansRealTalk.com For all the dumbest Trip Young and intern Tom Tell her White and black fans Take her to Manhattan Get your ass back slow Throw them off my stats, man If you're not tuned in I recommend the CAT scan And if the brain checks out Then you deserve a backhand Sports, gossip All the hot topics RealFansRealTalk.com Got it Take it to Hot Blossom You heard me, right? Heard? We're all going to the right And you can hear it from them first I'm talking about the latest I'm talking about the greatest Go check out the archives even tell a neighbor, tell him Bobby sent ya From screen to winter, tune in with your feet The only thing on your agenda is certified coach, son You know what I'm about, sir Real fans, real talk dot com I'm out, boy Real fans, real talk Podcast, real talk Real fans, real talk dot com Real fans, real talk dot com Real fans, real talk Real fans, real talk Real fans, real talk dot com Real fans, real talk dot com. Uh. Former holder of this vacant title. Lee conceding eight inches in reach and four inches in height. And Brilliant's got him in the opening 30 seconds. Right hand finished it. And he's all over the place, the legs have gone. This is the number two contender for this WBA title. And he's almost gone in the first few seconds. Seung Su Lee on the floor and still with shaky legs as Breland goes for the finish. In the opening round, it's all over. It's all over. One of the fastest ever world title fights. Mark Breland, the 25, regains the WBA Welterweight Championship of the World with that sensational stoppage of the outclass Seung Su Lee of South Korea.